I'm glad you sang the soldier song. I remember that from my grandparents and uh, tagging along with them. And it's, it's such a brilliant song because it sounds like something that would just come out of songs of the church or songs of faith and praise. But then you get to that line, we travel the message or we carry the message in crowded RVs. It's just a classic line uh, in that song uh, that otherwise just sounds like a regular hymn. But just a, a great, great song and, and great uh, tradition, great ministry that you're a part of. Uh, I've enjoyed being with you, visiting with you. Uh, I've met several of you who do remember my grandparents. I was a little bit surprised by that. They've been gone for a while. Uh, I've met a number of you that know my parents, and my parents weren't sojourners, but my dad spent his life and career as a gospel uh, preacher. We lost him unexpectedly here four years ago, and uh, so that's been a, a transition time in our lives. I was with my mom in Waxahachie, Texas, directly before coming here, and we've got boxes. Uh, Dad wrote uh, a couple self-published books, and, and one of those uh, we still have a lot of copies of. I brought some of those, put them out in the, uh, on the free table back there at the back, and uh, we just want those to bless and help someone. And so if you want to take a copy of one of those, I set 10 out, but I've got 30 more in my vehicle. So uh, feel free, help yourself to, to, uh, to those. If we run out, I could even get more and maybe send them send those next year. So I uh, just want those to, to bless the life of, of someone else. I uh, appreciate the singing uh, last night. Appreciate the singing this morning. Appreciate our brother singing the song, Standing on the Promises. That's our, our theme uh, for this morning. As we talk about those promises that like commands, like stipulations, are couched in the Bible within the framework of, of narrative. And, so the, and that's just a way of saying the Bible tells a story. Actually, the Bible tells a lot of stories, but those smaller stories come together and they comprise a much larger overarching story. The Bible tells one unified story from, from Genesis to Revelation. Some people call that the meta-narrative of Scripture. The big, the big story is all that that means. And so over the next two lessons, today and tomorrow, we're going to talk about both. The smaller stories that the Bible tells... But again, mostly that large overarching story of Scripture. And the first half of the big story, there are in the first half of the big story, there are a lot of promises that are pointing the way to Jesus who is at the center, the apex of the story. He's the hero of the story. And I want to explain, when I use the word story, I know a lot of people hear that word story and they think fiction. Or they think, perhaps they think children's stories. So uh, Green Eggs and Ham, that's a children's story. Little Red Riding Hood is a children's story. Uh, others might not think of children's story, but they do think of, uh, of fiction. So to read a story is to read a, a novel. Um, I had a, a, an older female relative that about noon every day she would say, well, it's about time to watch my stories. And what she meant were those soap operas that she sometimes indulged in. Those were her stories. And if story isn't fiction, it might be, for some, it might mean exaggeration. And so some of you men tell hunting and fishing stories. And those stories get a little bit bigger, a little bit more grandiose with time. Or perhaps you recall your playing days of playing baseball or playing football, and those stories tend to grow over time. They're a bit, perhaps, exaggerated. Well, that's not the way that I'm using the word story today. I'm talking about, instead about what is true, what, what grounds us, what helps us to, to make sense of our lives. Have you ever stopped to think about why the Bible contains so many stories? Why has God, in other words, why has God's revelation come to us in that particular manner and in that particular way? I, I, I hear a lot of metaphors. We use a lot of metaphors to describe uh, the Bible. And so we might speak of, of Scripture as being a blueprint, to use an architectural metaphor. Uh, we might speak of the Bible as being our roadmap, and so our destination is heaven. The Bible contains the directions of how to get there. I've even seen an acrostic Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. Uh, this is the way that we make it to heaven. Uh, the metaphor that we use sometimes is that it's a, a playbook. My, my dad was a coach and a preacher, and so he really liked that metaphor. This is our playbook. This tells us what the plays are uh, that we're supposed to run. Uh, a rule book or a constitution to use a, a legal metaphor. Now, I understand there, are, there is truth in all of those pictures and all of those metaphors. There are rules and laws in the Bible. Uh, there are things that we are to obey. There are consequences when we disobey. 
Uh, There are sections of the Bible that are like an architectural blueprint. God gives very explicit instructions to Noah about how to construct the ark or to the people about how to construct the, the tabernacle. And yet, I don't think any of us would say that the reading the Bible is exactly like reading one of those other documents. In fact, if we lean too heavily into any one of those metaphors, it can actually be counterproductive. It can actually lead us astray. If we think of the Bible simply as a legal document, nothing more than that, we might find some commands where no commands are intended. Uh, You realize there are some things in the Bible that are descriptive and not prescriptive. In other words, there are some things in the Bible that are just describing the way that certain people did things at a certain time, but not necessarily saying that those are the ways that Christians should do things in all times. Uh, We don't take the Lord's Supper in an upper room, for example. That was a descriptive statement about the night that the Lord's Supper was was instituted. It wasn't prescriptive. It wasn't for us. It's not that we have to take the Lord's Supper also uh, in an upper room. And so we have to be wise interpreters of, of Scripture in that. God could have revealed himself in any of these other ways. Uh, If he wanted us simply to have laws and and rules, he certainly could have revealed himself to us in that way. Put that, if you would, put that last uh, picture back up uh, on the screen. Uh, There on the top left corner, that's the United States Code. And so that's where you will find a, a compilation and codification of all the permanent federal laws of the United States. So don't you just want to curl up by a fireplace on a winter's night and read through that. I'm glad the Bible isn't like that. Uh, I'm glad the Bible isn't just simply a a rule book. And so you might find book 2, section 20, subsection 14 says do not commit adultery. So there it is. There's the rule. We have the law. Now, again, please don't misunderstand. Do not commit adultery is part of God's law. And anyone that's violating that needs to repent of that because they're hurting the heart of God. Uh, They're causing damage to themselves and to others, and they need to repent, and there's no ambiguity about that. And if you need book, chapter, and verse, Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, part of the Ten Commandments, very legislative uh, portion of Scripture says, do not commit adultery. But my point is that the laws that God gives us and the promises as well, the promises that we're talking about this morning, are couched within the larger framework of a story, a big story that God is telling, his, the, the meta narrative of the Bible. And the laws are presented in such a way that, that connect us to the heart of the lawgiver. And so none of these other books do that. A, a law book or a constitution doesn't uh, connect us to the heart of the person who gave us that. And yet the Bible is designed in such a way that it connects us to the heart of God. And so we need to see the Bible for what it is, not just a lifeless book of of rules and laws and do's and don'ts, but instead a book that connects us to the heart of God. And so let's go back to the command, as an example, that command, do not commit adultery. Uh, Yes, we have a statute, we have a law, but we also have some stories, don't we? For example, we know what happened to David when he was engaged in an adulterous affair with Bathsheba. And we know that, how that hurt the heart of God. And we know uh, also, though, that, that there were conse- we know that there were consequences for that. But also there was possibility of redemption after that great sin. And remember also that when the prophet Nathan came to confront David of his sin, what did he do? He told him a story. He said there was this rich man who owned a a large flock and some some out-of-town guest travelers came to him and and according to the culture of the time, you you wanted to be hospitable, you wanted to provide for them. But rather than taking of his flock, of which he had many, he went to this poor man who had only one ewe lamb that he treated like a child and he took from that poor man. And so Nathan tells a story and David is convicted of his sin. Now he doesn't know at first the story is being told about him. But when he realizes that, he's convicted of his sin. So stories are a powerful medium for conveying truth. Uh, We live in the backyard of Walmart headquarters. Uh, Mike does as well, the the Huddlestons. uh, Some of you that are from northwest Arkansas. Uh, Also, uh, there's a certain culture that has made Walmart a success. And some of that is attributed to the stories that were told about its founder, Sam Walton. Some of you have heard some of those stories. I heard one of Sam Walton was visiting one of his stores one day, and there was a man in the customer service area that had brought back a rod and reel that had broken, 
And he was having a little bit of trouble returning it. He didn't have his receipt with him. Sam Walton walked up to the man, introduced himself, walked him back to the sporting goods department, gave him an identical new rod and reel with his apologies. And so stories like that and many others about Sam Walton have circulated and have built the culture of Walmart. And so the question is, if you want to build a company, which would be more effective? Just to have rules and laws, the customer is always right, the customer deserves respect, or to have stories about the company's founder who lived according to that principle. And so we need to embrace the the story of Scripture as well as the smaller stories in the Bible that comprise that, that larger story. Listen to these words. The loss of story has serious consequences for the church. The primary mode of communication in the Bible is the story. The Bible contains numerous stories that explain Israel's existence as well as the grand narrative that explains God's plan for the world. Without the biblical narrative, Christians join countless others in our culture that have no basic story that shapes their lives. And we can learn something from the nation of Israel. Because long before uh, ancient Israelites owned Bibles, they were already retelling the story of what God had done. And so sometimes they would tell that story in great detail. Very long account. Sometimes it was just short summary statements, just a few brief sentences. I want you to consider the context in which Israel told her story. Uh, It was a story that was told in the home. Uh, Look at Deuteronomy, look with me at Deuteronomy chapter 6, starting verse 10. Deuteronomy 6, verse 10. When the Lord your God brings you into the land He swore to give to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. And when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only. And take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the people around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and his anger will burn against you. He will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not put the Lord your God to the test as did Masa. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight so that it may go well with you and so that you may go in and take over the good land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors, thrusting out all your enemies before you as the Lord said. In the future, when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws the Lord your God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders great and terrible on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. Now, there are some commands and some decrees and some stipulations in that passage that I just read, but they are in the context of a larger story that's being told of God's redemptive activity, how God is at work among his people. And so if you're going to share the commands, if you're going to share the law, share the story that they're a part of. And in just a few lines, a father could recite to his children the story from the exodus to the conquest, and and children grew up hearing that basic story. They didn't just tell it in the home, they told it in worship. Uh, in worship, for at the harvest festival, for example, uh, each male was instructed to appear before the priest uh, with a basket of produce and recite the words that are found in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 5 through 9. So turn over there, Deuteronomy chapter 26, starting in verse 5. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wondering, wondering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. The Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, subjecting us to harsh labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our ancestors, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, with great terror, with signs and wonders. He brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. 
And so this is just the, the basic story of Genesis to Joshua. It tells of the patriarchs, it tells of the exodus, it tells of, of the conquest. And it was important that they tell that story in the context of worship because it bridged the gap between the, where they were when it sometimes felt like God might be distant and what God, the mighty acts, the mighty deeds of God in the past. And if he's, if he's done those mighty things in the past, he could do them again. If he's rescued before, he could rescue again. And so they told the story in the home, they told the story in worship, and they also told the story during pivotal moments in history. And so look with me at 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel chapter 12. And we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. Sorry, I thought I had these marked. Then Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron and brought you and our ancestors up out of Egypt. Now then, stand here because I'm going to confront you with the evidence before the Lord as to all the righteous acts performed by the Lord for you and your ancestors. After Jacob entered Egypt, they cried to the Lord for help, and the Lord sent Moses and Aaron who brought your ancestors out of Egypt and settled them in this place. And so one verse later now, uh, he will t Samuel tells what happened when Israel in the past forgot their story. Notice the next verse. But they forgot the Lord, their God. And he sold them into the hands of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the uh, hands of the Philistines, the king of Moab, who fought against them. And so this was the example, example we have of Israel. They, they told their story. They told it at home, they told it in worship, they told it at pivotal times in, in, in history. But this was also the, the practice of the early church and should still, I believe, be the practice of the church. Now, when we think about Paul, we, we say, well, Paul didn't tell stories, Paul wrote letters. And, and that's true, but Paul appeals to the Christian story to, to reshape the values and the behaviors of those that he's writing to. For example, when the church in Corinth was misbehaving and all sorts of uh, of, of trouble in that church. There, there are, are abuses of, of the Lord's Supper. And so Paul, in trying to correct that, recounts a story that they've known from the beginning of their Christian existence. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 23, For what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so Paul is telling the story of the night when the Lord's Supper was instituted. And he's doing that to correct and to shape their behavior. Christian behavior should be shaped by the memory of Jesus' death. Uh, when we proclaim Jesus' death through through preaching and through reading of scripture and through the Lord's Supper, we remember that our story is about one who gave his life for us. And that memory transforms our values. That memory shapes our behavior. Paul does the same thing three chapters later in 1 Corinthians. Now he's dealing with the issue of some who doubt the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And so he says this, for what I received I passed on to you as of First importance, that Christ died for our sins according to his... Let's go on to the next one here. There we go. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So this is the Christian story. Now, uh, granted, it's just a brief summary, but that's, again, that's sometimes what the Israelites did. Sometimes they would tell the story in long form. Sometimes they would abbreviate it to just a, a few sentences to call to mind what was already uh, in their minds, uh, what they had already been taught. And it's interesting, Paul never actually tells stories about Jesus. Very rarely will Paul mention uh, information that appears in the four gospel accounts. But what he does is he gives a lot of these summary statements about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And not only that, but Paul also references a lot of Old Testament stories. Uh, even when he's writing to, to Gentile believers. He talks about Abraham, and he talks about Moses, and Hagar, and Sarah, and he assumes that his readers are going to be somewhat familiar with those stories. The foundation of the church's existence was a memory of the acts of God. And so Israel and the church knew the value of summarizing the grand story and repeating it regularly in worship. And so that's what we're going to do today and tomorrow, is summarize 
and tell the, the big story of, of Scripture. Now, before we get to that big story, another word about the smaller stories in the Bible. Uh, the ones that tell us about God's work in, in individual lives. As we read the story of Abraham, for example, we should put ourselves in Abraham's sandals and ask ourselves, would I do what Abraham did? Do I have the faith of Abraham? Would I go to a land, an, an unseen land that he's called me to? Now, you're doing that in your ministry. But would you put your son on the altar and sacrifice? When we read the story of Joseph, we, we should ask ourselves, how would I respond if I were betrayed by those closest to me, yeah. by my blood relatives? Uh, how can I persevere and trust God through difficult times? How much can I forgive? And see, we're right alongside uh, the characters and the personalities of the Bible. We're, we're right there with Peter as he steps out to walk on the water to Jesus, asking ourselves, Man, what would that first step be like? How scary would that be? Would I have the faith? Would I be the one to, to step out of the boat? We're right with the disciples who, who can't stay awake in the garden because we've been there before. You might be there right now. But sometimes we have trouble staying awake, staying with things. We, see, we put ourselves in, in the, these stories and, and the Bible comes alive for us. It challenges us in, in new ways. So we're going to spend the rest of our time reciting this, this big story, the meta-narrative of of scripture. We're just going to cover the first half of it uh, this morning. We'll do the second half tomorrow. But first, what I want to do is I want to talk about for a moment about how good stories work. Any good story. So uh, any good story will have these elements uh, to it. Uh, there we go. So there's all, it starts with an exposition. So the stage is set, characters are introduced. I'm sorry if you, I know that black font might be a little bit hard to read, but down in the bottom uh, left it says uh, exposition. So this is where characters are introduced, the stage is set, uh, then you go to a time of, of rising action. And so some conflict is introduced into the story. Uh, some characters die off, new characters are introduced, things are very dynamic, things are, are changing, things are leading to something, and they're leading to the climax of the story. Uh, this is where everything comes to a head. And so this is really the, 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 the meat and potatoes of, of whatever story it is that you're reading. And, but then after the climax, the story doesn't end there. Typically a good story, there will be falling action. And, and these are the implications of the climax. What happens as a result of that climatic event? And so this is still exciting. Things are still happening. Uh, and then you get any good story will have resolution. And a lot of times we judge whether a story is a good story or a bad story based on the ending. Uh, how many times do you read a novel or watch a, a television show or a movie and you say, well, I, I like that, that was a good movie, I like that ending. Or that was a terrible movie, that was a terrible ending, so I, I hated the movie. So, so the resolution is, is very, very important. Now, you could place the story of the Bible over this, this grid. And so here are the words that, that I'm going to use to describe the overarching story of the Bible. These aren't original with me. Uh, other people have suggested these. Some label them a little bit differently, but these are the words that, that I'm using. Uh, that as we put it over this grid, there is uh, creation, there's crisis, there are covenants, and then you get to the climax of the story, which is Christ. Then you have the falling action of the story, the, the age of the church, and then consummation or new creation. And so it's like a six act play. That's the plot, that's the basic storyline. Of the Bible. I believe when we read the Bible this way, it's not so much a method as it is respecting the way Scripture has come to us. That the Bible is Christocentric. That, that means that everything is either leading to Jesus or flowing from Jesus. Uh, everything is leading us up to the time of Christ and then flowing from uh, the time and the story uh, of Jesus. And so we tend to say things like, let Jesus come into your life. But it's really not so much about that as it is about moving our tawdry, humble lives into God's story and finding meaning there and purpose there. So let's examine the, the story. Um, Genesis chapter 1, sorry, I went a little too fast there. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And so right out of the chute, the very first verse in the Bible asks our most basic question, how did I get here? What am I doing here? God created. God created the heavens and the earth. And he has, as the creator, he has complete authority over everything that exists. He created this world to reflect his wisdom and his beauty. And not just this planet, but the entire cosmos. And when I first preached this series of lessons, I preached it at home in, in July. 
And as I was preparing this, the first pictures from the Webb telescope came out. And so we were able to see farther away with greater clarity than we've ever seen before. Just beautiful, uh, mysterious pictures. And God created all that too. He created this world and everything in it, but he created everything beyond this world. And, but out of all that God has made, his masterpiece, his crowning achievement is humanity. You say, well, what's so special about us? Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 and 27 says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and all, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And so God created us as image bearers to reflect his character. That's stated four times in just two verses. We are to reflect his beauty and his glory, be mirrors of his beauty and glory. Uh, we see that our first parents, Adam and Eve, were given a mission over creation uh, under God's authority to take care of creation, to maintain its purity, but also to live in harmo harmonious relationships that are most clearly seen in the husband-wife relationship there to become one flesh, and everything is so perfect for two chapters. And then we come to the next part of the story, the rising action of the Bible and the crisis. And so God gave Adam and Eve access to everything in the garden. It was all available for their nourishment and enjoyment. A long list of do's and only one don't. Do not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a new character, as often happens with the rising action of any story, new characters are introduced, now Satan comes into the picture, masquerading as a serpent. And he convinces Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit, and instead of being like God, as Satan has promised, there is uh, shame and guilt. Instead of being in harmony with God and each other, there's, there's blame and avoidance. Instead of running to God, now they're trying to hide from God, and when God confronts he announces judgment to the serpent. The serpent's now going to crawl and eat dust. But more importantly, a promise is made at this point. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. To the serpent, it said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. In other words, you may have defeated, you may have won this battle, you may have defeated Adam and Eve, but there's going to come a day when a descendant of Eve will deal you a fatal blow. It will crush you. you know, you'll, you'll inflict a wound on him, but he's going to crush you underfoot. And that's called foreshadowing. That's a great part of any good story. Uh, if you've seen the, the Mel Gibson movie, The Passion of the Christ, I know that's a, hard, that's a hard watch, I know. But I love, my favorite scene comes at the very beginning. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's in prayer. And actually, this, this slide, put that slide back up if you would. That's actually a scene from, I know it's kind of dark, but that's a scene from the movie. Perhaps you could see Jesus kneeling there. Snake comes up beside him. Jesus gets up from his prayer, and as he starts to walk away, crushes the head of that serpent into the ground. Now, that's a little artistic license on the part of Mel Gibson who directed that movie. We don't know anything about a serpent being there in the garden, but, but that's Mel Gibson's way of referring back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and also doing a little foreshadowing of his own in the context of, of, of his movie. And so judgment comes on the serpent, but also on Adam and Eve. For Eve, it will be increased pains in childbirth. It will be a desire to undermine her husband's leadership in marriage. For Adam, it will be increased difficulty in work. He'll earn his keep by the sweat of his brow. Adam and Eve don't die immediately. Uh, not in the physical sense, they die spiritually. Physical death will come as an outworking of, of the sin that has come into the world now. And even creation itself is negatively affected. Creation itself is cursed. But even in this, there's mercy. God sacrifices some animals. Their skins are used to clothe man and woman, symbolic of the covering over of sin. But because sin has come into the world, now the floodgates have opened. And so in the next generation, you have brother murdering brother, first murder committed in the Bible. And then as the population grows and becomes more sinful, eventually God decides just to destroy his creation, save Noah and his family, a few righteous ones, sends a cleansing flood upon the earth. 
That would seem to be a, a second chance, a new beginning, but we learned that even Noah, even though he was a righteous man, more righteous than most, Noah himself is flawed also. As the population grows, they gather together, they build a tower, the Tower of Babel, not as a monument to God, but as a monument to themselves. It says they wanted to make a name for themselves, so they build this tower. God's judgment again comes upon them. They're scattered, their language is confused. While justly angry, God did not turn away from a world bent on destruction, but turned to face it in love. With patience and tender care, the Lord set out on the long road of redemption to reclaim the lost as his people and the world as his kingdom. This is the story of the Bible. This is God's loving pursuit over time to bring creation back to its original beauty and order. And humans in particular, the crowning achievement of God's creation. And so this leads us to Act 3, which is still a part of the rising action of the Bible. We know that there's going to be a serpent crusher that's already been foreshadowed in Genesis 3.15, but to bring the serpent crusher into the world, God enacts a series of covenants. Great, I was in a, involved in a great Bible class in here yesterday about covenants and all the covenants that we read about uh, in the Bible. Covenant is a solemn commitment that God makes with a specific person or group of people to do something. God has made a promise, put himself under oath to fulfill that promise. And so there's a covenant with Adam, there's a covenant with Noah, but we're going to begin with God's covenant to Abraham. The Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Those who curse you will be cursed. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed by you. And so God revealing how he's going to bring the serpent crusher into the world from Abraham will be a, become a great nation. All the nations will be blessed uh, through his line. God will fulfill his plan of ruling over creation through humanity. Some people suggest there's not a missionary message in the Old Testament, that that's really a New Testament thing, the, the great commission and our, our calling, but, but that's wrong. There, there's a missionary mandate in the Old Testament. Israel was to be a channel of blessing to all the nations. They were to bless all people. They didn't always fulfill their missionary mandate, just like we don't always fulfill ours very well. Well, Isaac is born to Abraham. Jacob is born to Isaac. God changes Jacob's name to, to Israel. To Israel are born 12 sons. They become the 12 tribes of Israel. One of those sons is Joseph. Joseph's not the one that Jesus descends from. That's Judah. But Joseph, much of Joseph's story is told... Uh, comprises, is found in the book of Genesis, comprises much of the book of Genesis because Joseph is the, the bridge between the time of the patriarchs and the defining event of the Old Testament, which is the Exodus. And so through a series of events and misfortunes, and, and uh, you talk about favorite characters and favorite stories in the Bible, Joseph is one of mine. I'm a, I'm a Joseph guy. Love, love the story of, of Joseph. Love to preach and teach about, about Joseph. But Joseph ends up in Egypt far from home, uh, eventually ascends to a place of prominence, second only to Pharaoh in terms of, of, of position and power. Eventually, during, after a time of famine, moves his, his father and his brothers to Egypt to live out their days. Uh, then after some time, a new Pharaoh is in place that knows nothing of Joseph and his family. All he knows is that now this family has become a nation, and this nation, because they're so numerous, poses a threat to Egypt. And so they're enslaved for a period of 400 years. That's a long time. Uh, they're made to live as slaves until God raises up Moses to deliver his people from Egypt. Uh, God calls Moses when he's in the desert of Midian. Uh, this is, you could basically divide the, the life of Moses into four, four, or, I'm sorry, three 40-year periods. 40 years in the court of, and the household of Pharaoh, 40 years in the desert of Midian, 40 years leading the people in the wilderness. It's during that second 40-year period. God calls Moses from, from the burning bush. Uh, and God has a mission for him. Return to Egypt and lead my people out of captivity. And Moses says, well, who do I tell him sent me? And God says, you tell him I am sent you. I am? What, what does that mean? Well, you can translate it however you want. I used to be, I will be. You just tell them the God that was and forevermore will be is on the scene and he's here to rescue his people. And I'm sending you. I've heard their cries, I respond to my people when they're trapped and hopeless and enslaved and I have a mission to set them free. And so Moses and his brother Aaron, through Moses and his brother Aaron, God sends a series of plagues on Egypt. Moses leads them out across the Red Sea to the foot of Mount Sinai. Uh, when they arrive there, God speaks these words to the people. 
You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. So here is another covenant God is making to preserve the line of the serpent crusher. And as part of the covenant, God gives Israel the law to teach them how to live as a kingdom of a priest. Now again, uh, there's law in scripture, but it's embedded in the context of this larger story, this narrative of what God is doing. It's not just a lifeless law book. Of course, Israel blows it again. It's not 40 days after this that they're fashioning a golden calf. God forgives them. That's what God does. It's just going to be the first of many times that they turn away from God and turn to idols. After wandering for 40 years, they finally entered the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. This is Moses' successor. Uh, they gained control of much of Canaan during this time, but pockets of resistance still remain. Uh, sometimes Israel is oppressed, and that's a, often a judgment of God. And we see this uh, very clearly in the period of Judges. There's a, a cycle in, in Judges where uh, the people rebel, they're oppressed, they cry out to God for help. God sends a deliverer in the form of these, one of these judges, and then it's just rinse and repeat. That cycle just continues throughout uh, the book of, of Judges. Israel, there, something has to change. Israel thinks they have, uh, have a solution. Just give us a king. Just give us a king to rule over us. They want to be like the other nations. But the point is, they're not supposed to be like the other nations. They're supposed to be a holy nation. They're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, set apart, dif- distinct from the rest of the world. But God gives them what they ask for. You know the saying, be careful what you ask for. God gives them a king in Saul. Saul certainly looks the part, but he's not fully devoted to the Lord and eventually is removed. Then you have David. David is is a man who's after God's heart. He's certainly flawed, but he's pursuing the heart of God. And eventually God makes a stunning promise to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men and floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken from him. As I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Now, the initial and partial fulfillment is found in David's son Solomon. He expands the kingdom of Israel. He builds the temple, but he fails in many ways. He pursues foreign wives. The, uh, after his time, the kingdom is split. Israel and Judah, these divided kingdoms, and Israel and Judah continue their downward spiral into idolatry. God raises up prophets uh, who announce judgment but also extend the hope of restoration. Are you starting to see how gracious and patient God is in all this? And just continuing to, even though people are so obstinate and so stubborn and so rebellious and disobedient, even though we're so stubborn and obstinate and disobedient, God is so patient, so loving with us. And so the prophets foresee a day when there will be a new people of God, Jews and Gentiles, living under a new, perfect Davidic king. God will eventually transform not only his people, but creation itself. And so listen to these words. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their sins and remember their wickedness no more. The prophet Ezekiel says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. I will remove you from the... From you, the heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. I'll put a new spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws. And so God is going to write his law directly on the hearts of people 
full and complete forgiveness of sins, cleansing from idolatry and impurity will be a reality. He's going to give people a new spirit to obey him. The Holy Spirit is going to empower obedience. When this new covenant is established, it's going to be marked by a personal knowledge of the Lord based on final forgiveness, expressed in heart-level obedience, and it's going to come from one who's a greater prophet than Moses, a greater priest than Aaron, a greater conqueror than Joshua, a wiser ruler than Solomon, a greater king than David, the serpent crusher. He's the one that's coming into the world. But the question as the Old Testament closes is, where is he and when's he coming? That's the rising action of the Bible. And don't you love a good cliffhanger? I remember when I was growing up, the TV show Dallas was very popular, and it was especially popular where I lived because I lived in the Dallas area. And uh, during one of the last episodes of one of the seasons, J.R. Hewing got shot. You remember that? And so what were people asking all summer long for the next? Who shot J.R.? And, and I wasn't allowed to watch the show, so I still don't know who shot J.R. Uh, if you told me, I probably still wouldn't know because I didn't know who the characters were. But they say that was the greatest cliffhanger in television history. Well, this might not feel this morning like a cliffhanger to you because you know the story of the Bible. But just imagine you were reading it for the first time and you had only gotten to the point that we've gotten to this morning. Wouldn't you want to know what comes next? Wouldn't you just be on pins and needles wanting to know what came next? Well, that's tomorrow. <laughs> but if we've learned anything today, it's that God is sovereign over all. Over everything that happens in our lives, God is working out his purposes. And if, if we believe that to the halfway point, and we'll, we'll continue to see how that plays out uh, tomorrow in the next lesson. But we're, we're invited to believe that the same is true in our lives. That nothing is happening in our lives. That's not to say God causes bad things to happen in our lives, but he's sovereign over whatever does happen in our lives. And it's being used to, to God's purpose and to his glory if we continue, not in perfection, but if we just continue in his direction in all things. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Dear God, we're grateful for the time that we've had together today. Father, I'm so encouraged and grateful to be with Sojourners this week. And Father, just so appreciative of their ministry and their mission. And uh, Father, I just pray that you will, your blessings on everything that, that uh, goes on the rest of the day today, the, the, the classes, the practical classes, the Bible studies, the, the, the banquet tonight. Father, just thank you for this time. Father, thank you for revealing yourself in the pages of the Bible. Uh, Father, thank you for our part in the story that we'll talk about tomorrow. And uh, Father, thank you for every example that teaches and encourages us. Father, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.